other is really great about this is, is um, the objects that I placed in InDesign, they automatically come into Flash as symbols. Yeah, and this is huge. Coming from the interactive side of the business, um, Yvonne and I used to be in very separate areas. Uh, I would do things for Flash, and I would set things up. Now, uh, she can actually lay this book out and export it to Flash, and it's great that she has her individual assets set up in InDesign. Um, you think about creating symbols. For those of you familiar with Flash and all the previous versions of CS, um, it's a really tedious process. You take your Flash uh, assets, but they might start in Photoshop, they might start in Illustrator. You have to export them individually and then name them. So, so Yvonne doesn't really know how good she has it to be able to have all these things separate when she brings them into Flash and to be able to animate them from there. It's really cool. So Yvonne, you got to pay it off now. Yeah, yeah, but I am a Flash designer now, so check it out and bring Pickle Bird <laughs> to life. <laughs> Excellent. That's pretty cool. Great. Again, hey, thanks guys. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank you, Johnny. So one of the things that we have not talked about, in fact, the entire presentation, is we haven't brought up Photoshop. And is it because we have uh, downplayed Photoshop at all? And, and in fact, the truth is just the opposite. Uh, we think this is such a compelling re, uh, reason to motiv uh, motivate people to move to Photoshop CS4 and to the suites, which feature both Photoshop and Photoshop Extended. We wanted to show it to you firsthand. So there's many things, of course, in Photoshop that are compelling. One of the things I talked about before is the performance enhancements, the time saver things. Um, what I want to show you now is many people here have probably a, a, a 10, a 14, a 20 megapixel camera. Well, you're all wimps because you're looking at a 442 megapixel image. This is about a 2 gigabyte file size right now. And just to show you the performance now, I'm going to zoom in here real quick. And we'll just zoom on the W logo here and get real tight on that for a second. And then we'll clear up. And that gives you an idea of, of where we're going. Um, if I come in now, and let's just zoom in, and we'll go across town here. This is the Adobe headquarters, by the way, in San Jose. We'll check out what time it is across uh, town here. We'll check out uh, a sign that's maybe, um, this sign here is about a mile and a half behind Adobe. This sign here is about uh, two miles behind Adobe. So just to show you the performance of how we can zip around, this is also a great management tool, because we can actually zoom in and find out who's coming in to work a little late in the morning, check out their license plates, and notify security if there's any issues of uh, things we're concerned with. Um, now, again, remembering this is a, a almost 2 gigabyte file size, let me just show you some of the GPU performance. This is a 2 gigabyte file size that I'm just basically rotating almost in real time on the screen. I'll, I'll pass out air sickness bags if I keep doing that any longer for folks. So again, really proud of the fact of what we've done in the performance space around uh, Adobe there. Now, the next one I want to show you is around with Extended. We've actually incorporated 3D capabilities uh, with Photoshop. Now, what you're looking at is we've taken a picture of this theater here with this is about 18 to 20 still images just taken in a three dimensional view, meaning in, in circular and up top and bottom. And then we've taken Photoshop and stitched them together to create a 2D image that's stretched out. Now, what we want to do is go in and take advantage of the 3D side of this. I want to go in now, and I actually want to uh, wrap this 2D stretched image over an object. So what I'm going to do is it will take a sphere here, a panoramic, which is just basically a circle. And it'll take a second. And now we're looking at uh, the panorama view, where if I zoom out, just to show the point, I will zoom all the way out just to show you that this is actually a sphere rotated around. So you're looking around at what it is. And now I'm inside that sphere. So I'm in the center, back in the center. And now I'm just going to rotate this around. And now you're looking at what looks like a 3D viewpoint of this theater. Remember, this was created starting with simply 2D images. If I go up to the ceiling here, you'll notice that where Photoshop has actually put together and stitched together the ceiling, where it comes together, there's a little flaw there where it's merged. So we're going to just activate another layer here that shows that we put a little centerpiece here in the design. And let's make sure we have that. Uh, right where we want it. And then we'll go through quickly here and just uh, merge that down. And now, if I go back in, I rotate that around. That is now part of that image. So it's become part of that 3D image. Now remember, I just added this in, but I'm going to go back and look at now the original background. And you'll notice up at the top of the image, it's taken that ornament and actually stretched it across as if it was back into it, what it would look like in a 2D image. It stretched it across the ceiling to make those things happen. Now, the last one is actually my favorite demo to show. And this is something called content-aware scaling. Now, we're trying to make a magazine cover here, this golfing magazine mock-up that we've done. You can see the text there. But my picture is actually a horizontal format picture. And so what we want to do is actually take this. Well, you all know that if I went in and try to resize this, I'd come through. And as I
happens to the players? Of course, as I shrink it, those players get rather thin. Um, and by the way, if I sh increase them, of course, they get rather bloated. Now, I don't want to do that because I want to actually fit this image into the space. So what I can do now is come in and let's go first crop our image. And let's start with about the magazine formats, roughly about there. Um, we'll take that. And now I'm going to go in and the new technique called content-aware scaling. It'll show me where my original image was. Now watch what happens to the individuals. The important people in this image are actually the people. As I shrink this down, notice what happens to their proportions. They stay natural. And I can actually go all the way down just to make my point and shrink it all the way down. And notice that even if I shrink it down there, it takes pixels in between the people out. And by the way, this works in both directions. So if I shrink it up to, or blow it up to two or, in fact, take out space below them, it'll take some grass out. And lastly, if you look at the horizon line here above their heads, if I increase this up on top, you'll notice that, in fact, the horizon line stays the same, even though I'm filling in and adding more pixels in the clouds in between. So imagine the implementation when you're trying to actually take a, a, a document or a piece of content and actually shrink it down to fit on a cell phone. And I actually have to take advantage of that space, but I want to keep the important things, but actually get rid of things that are not as important, such as the grass, the sky, or in this case, the ocean. Now, the last thing I want to do is a simple demo, which just says, same thing, content-aware scaling. What I want to do now is put a square peg in a round hole, which is I want to put that VW bug into this space. So again, as I come in, what we're going to do is go back to content-aware scale. I will now come in and actually shrink that down to a point where it actually fits between these two. And it's kind of like the uh, smart car. This is the smart bus. Um, I'll blow it up here. But I want you to notice this just exaggerates the point around look at the tires, look at the handle on the car, and the lights. They stay in proportion. So the algorithms here are determining what is important in this image. And then I can go back and basically tweak minor, make minor tweaks to some of the image that I want to actually fix and correct for down the road. So again, just a tip of the iceberg. If you want to get a lot more detail, again, an immense amount of material on the website to go get more detail on not just Photoshop, but the entire portfolio. So to wrap things up here tonight, I just want to say um, what you've seen, again, is just a, a, a very cursory overview of what we have. Underneath this is a lot more detail I encourage you guys to look for. The website has product details. It has case studies, tutorials, hints, blogs. John Knack's blog on Photoshop will have a lot of the new material there. Um, and lastly, I want to point out that Adobe TV, which is one of the uh, new online services that we've had here recently in the last uh, nine months or so, has about 10 hours of content uh, specifically on CS4. So Bob Donlin and his team have actually partnered with people like Canon, NVIDIA, Intel, HP, and Wacom, and actually got these guys to actually produce what is very compelling instructional uh, information about uh, the technologies. So lastly, again, I want to thank all of you here in, this, in the audience uh, for joining us today, those of you around the world who've been able to join us. And I especially want to give thanks to the literally thousands of folks back in my team and other teams within Adobe, the engineers, the uh, product development teams, the manufacturing teams, et cetera, that have worked their tails off and gone through a lot of Red Bull and pizza to bring you what we think is the most compelling release in Adobe's history. Thank you very much for joining us today.